in terms of research was entirely different. So Amanda has really changed that. So Amanda tonight is joined by um, two of her directors. So I'd just like to introduce those as well. So hello, Alex. Hello. Uh, Alex Jones is Director of Insights and Research. And um, Richard, and I'm probably going to Kue. I totally mispronounced Richard's name earlier, so I want to get that right. <laughs> And he's Deputy Director of Research and Evaluation. So it's so good of the three of you to come because you've got the most extraordinarily busy roles. So thank you. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. So I'll hand over to you now, Amanda. <clears throat> thank you. It's extremely good to be here this evening. Thank you very much for coming out on a chilly January evening. I know we've got quite a lot of people online, um, which is always harder to address, but I'm glad you're here as well. And Michelle, thank you for your kind introduction. It was an absolute joy working with you at Ofqual and also um, with Joanne on the, the Standards Advisory Group there. Um, it was an incredible experience um, there for nearly six years, I think, <laughs> that, I, that, that I spent, spent there. I learned so much from you. So I have been asked today to talk about the, the use of research evidence in education. And I'm going to talk mainly, I think I might stand here because um, one of the, the complications of my job is, is that everything I say has to be published. So I do more or less have to stick uh, to, to my script. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about how, how Ofsted uses research, but I'm also going to be talking about its wider use in the education sector. And at the moment, overall, I think there's a tremendous amount for the education sector to be proud of. I think England really is ahead of many countries in harnessing research effectively in education. And I have to say, I think Ofsted has clearly been part of that movement in recent years. I have to declare at the outset, I am not myself an education researcher, but I have now spent more than 20 years in education. And in all of that time, I've been working in different contexts to make 
good use of available evidence and to encourage others to do the same. And I've made sure that at Ofsted, we now have the capacity to do that well. And of course, we have several big stakes um, in good use of research evidence. I'm hoping, uh, what have I got to do? For, oh, no? Just one. Okay. Right. <laughs> so first, we want to ground our inspection approach as, as securely as we can in evidence about education itself. Um, the slides will be available, I think, um, from the, the department afterwards for anybody who wants them. In this way, inspection can encourage schools and of course, nurseries, colleges, and all the other entities that we inspect um, to align their models and practices with what is already known about quality. That's a big part of being a force for improvement. And secondly, we aim to build and iterate inspection models that achieve the intended purposes with sufficient validity and reliability and minimal unintended consequences. Of course, we don't have total freedom here. We have to work within our statutory framework and within the policy constraints that are set by government, including funding. So that's two stakes. The third stake is the aggregation of the evidence that we collect in doing our work and the related research work that we carry out. That makes us a generator of research evidence for others' benefit, as well as a user. And of course, we're just one part of a wider landscape. Much excellent work has been carried out in universities like this one over many years. The Education Endowment Foundation has become one of the part of the national network of what work centers and many other institutes and bodies do significant work. And that brings me to a fourth strand, which links back to the first. Many bodies act as intermediaries, translating complex maps of academic evidence into reports and summaries that are more immediately useful to practitioners. And this isn't of itself a core Ofsted activity, but we know that it's one of the ways that our products are used. For instance, over the last two years, we've drawn up and published a series of curriculum reviews. These offer a researched conception of what we consider to be a high quality education by subject and by phase. They help to translate our researched framework into subjects and phases. And they, they provide a platform for inspector training in judging curriculum quality. And of course, if we are to be consistent as an inspectorate, we must have a shared conception of what constitutes quality. If you ask people to judge quality in the absence of a clear corporate statement, they will inevitably bring their own views to bear. And of course, individual views will always vary to some extent. But we also know that schools draw extensively on these reviews to develop their curriculums. They've been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. And I believe this shows a tremendous appetite for engagement with educational researchers, as well as an understandable desire to gain some insight into Ofsted's approach. But of course, there is no comprehensive and definitive version of educational <coughs> truth. There's much that is well established, but much that is not. New evidence and insights can cast doubt or just cast doubt on or, or discredit previously accepted wisdom. I'll come back to the difficulties this creates a bit later. But children's lives cannot be put on hold. So neither schools nor we can down tools to wait for a pot of fairy gold at the end of an evidential rainbow. We must work with what's available and with what's most relevant to our work, while recognising that we will always have to iterate in the light of new developments. And I think this is a good moment to explain just a little bit more about Ofsted. In many ways, we operate as you would expect. The principles of good inspection and regulation are straightforward. Proportionality, accountability, consistency, 
transparency and targeting. These are the Hampton principles and they're deeply embedded in our frameworks and handbooks. Let me just, so how does an inspectorate work? I think we operate to a fairly standard model. So our frameworks and handbooks, these are the, the policy instruments. They're powerful levers on the education sector and they exert influence long before an inspector comes through the door. The inspection process itself is designed around professional dialogue. It's intended to help schools improve. And our post-inspection surveys do find that in most cases, it does. At the end of most inspections, we make judgments for overall effectiveness and for several component judgments. They give parents, responsible bodies and government a clear statement about the overall performance of the institution. And we also publish inspection reports describing what's being done well and what needs to improve. Now, we inspect at the level of the individual school and other institution, um, but to report only at this level would be a tremendous waste of evidence and insight. So a strand of our work, we have a strand that is responsible for drawing out the insights from the aggregation of our evidence and for additional research when needed to supplement this and also to run our evaluation programme. In fact, there are sort of three distinct flows here. One is the <coughs> dissemination programme that includes the curriculum reviews I just talked about, thematic reviews, other research such as um, reports recently commissioned by DFE on tutoring and on T-levels. Um, these um, are intended mainly either for the education sector or for policymakers. One flow come from our evaluation um, work comes back into um, the inspection process pieces, the professional dialogue, the judgments and reports, and one strand flows back into iterating our inspection frameworks and handbooks. And of course, in these activities, we draw on the flow of what is coming out of other institutions. We don't exist in a bubble. And I also just want to take a couple of minutes um, to consider the purposes of inspection because they're, they're very relevant in deciding how we use research. I think there are three main purposes for inspection today. And these sit in the context of a long-standing government policy that puts responsibility for diagnosis with Ofsted, but locates responsibility for treatment and support with schools themselves <coughs> and with um, the regions group at the Department for Education. And this policy, I will say, is often misunderstood by people who would like us to function primarily as a support mechanism. So what are the purposes today? Um, first, um, inspections provide information and assurance to parents. Ofsted was created in the early 90s in the context of the parent charter. Secondly, they inform central and local government and other controllers of schools. Given the independence of our judgments, they provide a legitimate basis for action by others when it's needed. And they also signal excellence that others can learn <coughs> from. And thirdly, they can and should be of value to the people at the receiving end, to teachers and to heads. This is true even when inspection is limited to diagnosis. I'd be deviating too far from my subject today if I went into the reasons why, but this is a matter of tremendous importance to me. So I'm going to take as a case study the development of our main um, education inspection framework, the EIF. It had to meet those three purposes. They're largely defined by government, but we do have flexibility in how we go about meeting those purposes. And we aim to ground all our work 
in research evidence and to operate as transparently as possible. So we took time and care to develop the framework iteratively <coughs> over two years to prepare. We reviewed a wide range of research from, from many universities, from the Education Endowment Foundation, from the Department for Education, and from other sources. We summarized what we drew on in a review that was published to provide transparency, both as to the evidence we used and our interpretation of that evidence. And this gave the framework some, some additional credibility. It showed the thought and attention and range of views that fed into its development. And we also did some substantial work on the state of curricula in both primary and secondary schools. And that, that itself was informed by research into cognitive psychology. This is an important body of knowledge that wasn't always being drawn on. The first phase of our curriculum research found systemic weaknesses in much of curriculum approach and design. In the second phase, we studied a sample of schools that had curriculum thinking and development embedded in their approach. Phase three tested a model of inspecting curriculum based on our findings. This confirmed much of what we'd found in the first two phases and also allowed us to explore some potential curriculum indicators, some evidence collection methods, and also the practical limitations of inspections. And we were also able um, to test our ability to discern strength from weakness in curriculum development and application. All of this evidence gathering, research, consultation, evaluation, iterative development and testing resulted in the most evidence framework that Ofsted has ever produced. The EIF is built around a strong and well-warranted construct of what good education is. And it's built around the importance of curriculum, the real substance of education. And I've talked before about the substance and purpose of education. It does need to, repair, to prepare young people for life and work, but that is not all. It must also be about broadening their minds and horizons. It should give them the tools to make their communities and the world better places to live in. And it should allow them to contribute to society and to the advancement of civilization, not just the labor market. The EIF is broad enough to recognize all of these purposes of education, and it's why it firmly promotes a full and rich conception of knowledge, not a narrow and reductive one. The EIF and the sector-specific handbooks now underpin all the education inspections we do. Um, actually, that's not quite true because I think we have slightly different arrangements for some of the, the professional development inspections. Um, but all the, all the, the main um, provide, um, education provider inspections, um, they, they help us to assess the quality of education that a service provides. And I will add, there's been considerable interest from overseas inspectorates and ministries in the EIF <coughs> and in how we developed it. As far as we know, it really is the first education inspection framework to be developed in this way. Now, to do the EIF, we had a wealth of research and findings to draw on, but that isn't always the case. Um, sometimes we have to develop in the light of experience, bringing in such evidence is available. So for a quick contrast, I thought I'd talk briefly about our new framework for area special needs inspections. Now, these review the effectiveness of all the relevant agencies in a local area in providing sort of joined up services for special educational needs and disabilities. There's surprisingly little um, evidence, research evidence to draw on about how to do this well. In planning a successor to our first framework, we recognized the important work and lessons from the first set of inspections, but we did also see room for improvement. We already identified some recurring weaknesses, some flaws, delay and delays in the identification of children's needs. And we'd also often found a lack of clarity about who's responsible for what between the various organizations involved. 
We also listened to a lot of feedback from children, from young people and their families, from, from people working in all kinds of SEND and related services, and from the many organisations that support children and young people with SEND, as well as representative bodies. And we combined the inspection analysis with the feedback from the various strands of engagement that enabled us to develop and refine our new proposals. And then we tested <coughs> the proposals or aspects of them um, through discussions and a set of trial inspections. Piloting is a really powerful tool for us. All of this led to a new approach with nine proposals for improvement. And we consulted on it last summer. Happily, we found there was strong support for all the proposals, um, which increased our confidence in the direction we were recommending. And it also provided valuable comments and suggestions that led to some changes and some clarifications in the draft framework and the handbook. So in summary, here we started building on an existing framework and inspection programme, incorporated some analysis and feedback and engagement, some testing of the new proposals, consultation, um, all going into the new framework. We do think this will create, this is an approach that will improve outcomes for children with special needs and help families to navigate a complex and sometimes somewhat adversarial system. And we hope it will strengthen accountability by clarifying where responsibility for improvement lies. It's, I think it's a good example of how to develop an inspection framework in a less evidence rich environment. Um, second strand is evaluation. These case studies illustrate how we draw on established research and generate research to design our models. That was the first box, if you remember, in the model of the inspectorate in the light of both well-developed and underdeveloped bodies of research. But we also need to know whether our frameworks <coughs> and methodologies are being implemented as intended and having the effects that we expect. We therefore have a program of evaluation work. When we do this, we're making a contribution to the body of professional knowledge about inspection. But significantly for us, um, the evaluation work completes a positive feedback loop. We harness the findings and then use them um, in refining our, in, in our processes, our handbooks and our frameworks. <coughs> One important example of how we evaluate is using research methods to establish how reliable inspections are. Our frameworks and handbooks clearly outline what we focus on in inspection and what we consider to be of high quality. So inspector judgment is from the very start focused on a construct that's transparent to all through our handbooks. Our inspectors are there to apply the framework, not to apply their own individual idea of what good looks like. But beyond our routine quality assurance activities, we've conducted reliability studies on inspector judgment into rate of reliability. In other words, do two inspectors come to the same judgment? Um, we saw high levels of agreement in the results. Taken together, our quality assurance work and reliability studies all feed back into the continuing development of our frameworks and handbooks. I want to talk a bit more actually about the concept of consistency of inspection judgments. Those of you who here who like um, Michelle Meadows and Joanne Baird, uh, experts in educational assessment, will immediately recognise the issue of reliability with all its counterintuitive complexities. School inspection is, of course, a process of human judgment. It complements various other measurement processes, including exams and testing, and also many other kinds of measurements, such as attendance reporting. Judgments of overall effectiveness are composite judgments reflecting many aspects of performance. Now, the reliability of human judgment processes has been studied in, in contexts in and beyond education. Michelle's 2005 review of the literature on marking reliability was something I read early in my time at Ofqual, 
and gave me really valuable insight into the strengths and limitations of human judgment. For me, <coughs> there are two particularly important lessons that come from that literature. First, that perfect reliability is unlikely to be achievable. And secondly, that improving reliability often comes at the price of sacrificing some validity. The narrower the construct you choose to assess, the more precisely you can assess it, at least in theory. But the narrower the construct, the less valuable the assessment is likely to be in practice. And as you all know, national expectations of schools and other education institutions are broad. There is a democratic consensus that compulsory education should extend far beyond minimum competence in maths and literacy, that it should encompass wider personal development on many fronts, as well as academic study, and that schools should have responsibilities for safeguarding children. This means that the overall effectiveness that we are required to judge is and is likely to remain a broad construct. The corollary of this is that so-called perfect reliability is not achievable. We accept this in many other areas of life, though perhaps without pausing to think a great deal about it. Driving test examiners, judging judges passing sentences in court, judges in an Olympic sporting event. I'm sure you can think of other examples where we accept that, we'll, that there will be some level of human variation. The, the, the Eurovision Song Contest is perhaps an example where the divergence between markers is so extreme to suggest that they may not all be assessing the same construct. And in fact, one of the reasons that inspection continues to exist is precisely because we all recognize that data measures alone cannot carry the entire weight of measuring education quality. And there can be unintended consequences of putting too much weight on data outcomes alone. There can be unhealthy backwash for, for children and adults alike. So looking under the bonnet at how outcomes are being achieved has real value. There will also therefore always be a degree of variability that cannot be engineered out of inspection and where we could do more harm than good if we tried. But of course, we take consistency very seriously. We design the framework with great care to be clear and structured and unambiguous. We design inspection processes with great care. We put a great deal of effort into recruiting and training our, and training our inspectors when they join in their early months and throughout their time with us. We have many quality assurance processes covering all aspects of the process and also our reporting. And we have many sources of feedback post inspections, surveys, complaints, our evaluation work, as well as regular interaction with sector representative bodies. All of this is used to keep on improving our work. But our research isn't only about developing and improving Ofsted's regular work. We publish a lot that faces the outside world. Some of this is relatively straightforward, aggregated information. We produce official statistics, including inspection outcome data, and output from surveys such as our annual children's social care survey. But we also, we also aggregate, analyze and disseminate evidence that we collect through our routine work to produce our annual report and other publications. And we do more than just secondary analysis of inspection and regulatory evidence. We conduct primary research where we need to, to supplement what we can learn directly from inspection. Our body of work on pandemic recovery was a significant recent contribution. We recognised that we were particularly well placed to report on the continuing challenges that schools and children faced as education gradually returned to normal. We do have unparalleled access to thousands of children and professionals. We saw the effects of the pandemic and restrictions on children, on their academic progress, but also on their physical and social and emotional development. And for a minority of children, being out of the line of teacher's sight had harmful consequences. We saw the efforts that have and are still being made to accelerate children's learning and wider development and to address those harms. Collating and aggregating 
and evaluating what we found gave valuable insights. We reported on a live shifting situation, publishing dozens of rapid reports, briefing notes and commentaries from September 2020 onwards. Our reports and the speed of their publication helped everyone to understand what was happening. I think our insight was crucial in making sure that policymakers understood the continuing challenges. And it let us highlight the, the good or innovative practice that others could learn from. That we did also report on poorer practice and on how we would expect schools and other providers to improve. And professionals in all sectors have told us that our research accurately reflected their experience, the pandemic and post-pandemic periods. We know that we were one of the few bodies doing early research on this, and there was international interest in our work. It was picked up in places like Portugal and South Korea, for example, as well as by other European inspectorates. And I think that showed both its importance, but also the scarcity of credible research on education during the pandemic. And this work made us very aware of the difficulties that schools, colleges, nurseries were facing at every level, from those working directly with children all the way through to their leaders. And it also gave us a strong basis for our decision to return to inspection, confident that we had the right level of understanding of the continuing challenges. It helped us to, to frame the right expectations suitably high but still realistic. We wanted to see high ambition and support to help children make up for lost time, but our judgments needed to be fair in this context. And it's worth noting that the flexibility designed into the EIF allowed us to do this within the existing framework. The previous framework would not have been able to adapt in the same way. We would have needed a new temporary framework something that professionals in the sector clearly told us they did not want. The sector had spent time contributing to the development of EIF and then <coughs> in understanding and embedding it. Sector feedback really was very clearly in favor of sticking with the framework suitably applied. We're also examining other trends in education and social care, bringing our unique position and, and reach to bear for the benefit of children and learners. We've researched, for example, how local authorities plan for sufficient accommodation and services for children in care, how alternative provision for primary age pupils is being used, and how secondary schools are supporting struggling readers. Much of our research work is commissioned by government. One example is our, our work on tutoring, the, the first phase of which was published last year. So based on visits to 63 schools to explore their tuition strategies and, and how well they'd integrated tuition with their core education programs to report on the progress and to the extent possible, the effectiveness of the national tutoring program um, on which the government is of course spending um, a billion pounds. We found some good use of tutoring, but also that quality varied greatly depending on both the school and the tutoring provider. And we also found limited understanding of the effectiveness of tutoring. Used well and properly integrated, tutoring can be a huge help to pupils who fall behind, but it is a very expensive intervention. It therefore needs to have a big enough impact to justify its cost. There are, and there are obvious <laughs> difficulties with assessing impact. Getting a handle on the effectiveness of tutoring at the level of the individual child <coughs> is always going to be problematic. How do you attribute progress as between classroom teaching and tutoring? It may be possible where tutoring is very targeted at specific topics or areas of the curriculum, but expectations here do need to be realistic. Our reviews are already helping the government develop the tuition programme further and helping schools and colleges to implement and integrate tutoring better. The second phase of our research, which is currently in the field, will explore how schools are adapting and applying the programme after a year's experience. Excuse me. Um, recent um, DfE commissioned evaluations of other programmes, such as skills boot camps and T levels are further examples. I'm looking at the clock and conscious of time, so I might um, pass over 
talking any more about those. Um, some of our work is also um, probably best characterized as policy evaluation. One recent example was the exemption of outstanding schools from inspection. We've now reported on the first year of inspections of previously exempt schools since the exemption was lifted. Most schools inspected were no longer outstanding and over a fifth um, were judged requires improvement or inadequate. These were generally the schools that have gone longest without inspections of typically around 13 years. And we've also set a somewhat higher bar for the outstanding grade in EIF. So no one should overinterpret this data. But nevertheless, we can now see that the policy expectation of continuing improvement in the absence of inspection was not realized. We will be publishing a further report on this strand of inspection later this spring, including an analysis of the weaknesses that have been found in formerly outstanding schools that have been judged RI or inadequate. Our research doesn't just provide recommendations or suggest improvements to policymakers, though. We publish research reports and reviews for the education sector, early years schools and post-16, from the viewpoint of our inspection framework. For example, we recently published a best start in life research review, which examines the factors that contribute to a high quality early education. And the review drew on a range of sources, including academic and policy literature. That was the first in a series of reports on early education. We identified some of the features that high quality early years curriculum and pedagogy may have. What were those features? A curriculum that considers what all children should learn. Practi practitioners who choose activities and experiences after they've determined the curriculum. And adults who think carefully about what children already know, teaching them what they need to know and broadening their interests. It was the latest in the series of research reports <coughs> published since early 2021. I mentioned the school curriculum reviews earlier. Um, now I think this might be a good moment to pick up on the issue of challenge and contest um, in education research. Some of our work um, is in areas where there's little that is contested, but much of it, um, like so many other domains of knowledge, is in areas that are highly contested. And this is certainly true of much of the curriculum. I can remember a, a previous Ofqual research director, Michel's predecessor, um, a man with a very long memory telling me that in successive rounds of qualification reform, the two subjects that have always been the hardest to finalize have been religious studies and mathematics, where the divergence of views among academic subject experts is especially, and um, perhaps surprisingly to those who aren't in the mathematics world, particularly wide. I also remember hearing that in the most recent round of reforms, disagreement between members in another subject expert group was so profound that tears were shed in a group meeting. It is therefore entirely unsurprising that our work in these areas attracts hostility from some quarters. I think this tends to reflect those wider continuing disputes. As we said in the principles paper, which we published ahead of the curriculum reviews, Educational research is contestable and contested, and so are documents such as these research reviews. Therefore, we are <laughs> sharing our thinking with subject communities so that we can get input from the broader subject community. We hope that publishing our evidence base for how we've developed our understanding of subject quality will provide insight, both on what evidence we've used and on how we've interpreted that evidence when creating research criteria for our subject reports. Each curriculum review collates relevant research evidence, but they are not intended to be all embracing papers <coughs> covering the entirety of academic thought on a subject. That's not our job, and it wouldn't be a responsible use of our time and resources. Instead, their primary purpose is to lay out the evidence base for the kind of subject education that our frameworks reward as high quality. They give a broad foundation for the judgments that we make. 
while it's not their primary purpose, we do also hope that they will help subject leaders in their curriculum planning. The reviews are not narrowly prescriptive, but offer what appear to be reliable general principles that schools can then apply intelligently. They're also not overly restrictive. Each review lays out only the possible features of high quality education without claiming that these are the only features. The enormous popularity with schools of both the reports and the related webinars that we offer is I think an encouraging indicator that they are indeed helpful. <coughs> And we've also heard how helpful schools have found having reviews across the set of subjects. Schools are really appreciating the exploration of the nature of a high quality curriculum across subjects, including in computing, PE, music, and so on. And the reviews fill a vacuum because in some subjects, curriculum, as opposed to pedagogical approaches, hasn't been a significant focus of other work. Subject and senior leaders rarely, regularly, sorry, regularly share their appreci appreciation of our work, which gives them guidance across a range of subjects. And of course, this will in turn contribute to improving the quality of education and raising standards for all children. In exploring the place and function of research evidence in education policy and practice, it's also interesting to reflect on how the sectors we inspect themselves use research. On the one hand, there's a very positive picture with much to be optimistic about. We know that many teachers see being reflective practitioners and researching practice as part of their professional identity. Teachers and other practitioners draw on EF toolkits and summaries, for example, and apply them in their everyday practice. All of this is helping to eliminate some of the perhaps fashionable fads and follies of the past. Twinned with our focus on subject education in the EIF, there's also been a renewed interest in subject-based research. This development in particular really helpfully bridges academic departments within universities with classroom subject teaching in different phases of education. And teachers write about these things, blog about them, and exchange their knowledge at practitioner conferences, such as Research Ed. And the aroma of that interest has drifted upwards, out of the classroom, to school leaders, who, because of their leadership of the curriculum, are developing their subject research knowledge about how best to sustain and develop school subjects. In this way, I think we've contributed to an intellectual resurgence in school leadership, and I think this really is a tremendous thing to awaken intellectual curiosity at all levels of educational institutions. But on the other hand, this does bring complexity. As you all know, navigating research is not without its difficulties. The sheer range of research and evidence in a domain as large as education is daunting. Some research is not empirical, other kinds of research are, <coughs> using qualitative and quantitative methods. Discerning strength, weakness, relevance, and applicability in research requires professional judgment. And without this, the cargo cults and lethal mutations can emerge. What I do think would be helpful now is a clearer sort of overall architecture that recognizes and values all the parts of the system that generate educational research and evidence, including the entities that are translating research into usable products for practitioners and the tools to navigate it. And it would also, I think, be helpful to have a clearer sort of medium term focus on building consensus through research. Now, this evening, I've concentrated mainly on how Ofsted uses research. What I really wanted to make clear was that research isn't just one part of what we do, it's a part of everything that we do. It informs our day-to-day -day work, our frameworks and handbooks, and our overall approach. It helps us sort of strive to be better and to inspire improvement in the sectors we work in. And it lets us share what we know with government and with practitioners so that they can all make informed decisions. 
I hope that you'll take this talk and our wider approach as showing how much we value <coughs> the work that happens in this and in many other universities here and abroad, as well as in smaller specialist institutions. I believe that, that you and the whole education sector benefit from this renewed intellectual energy, which is being harnessed so constructively in so many places. I'm fortunate to have been in positions over the last 20 years where I've been able to promote this, this very healthy development. And with that, I'm going to finish and say that I'm very happy to take questions. I've brought along my two colleagues who, who Michelle has already introduced. Um, I will say that Richard, um, as well as being the Deputy Director for Research and Evaluation, was also, is, is, is also the Religious Education Lead in our Curriculum Unit and was the author um, of our RE Curriculum Review. Thank you very much. Thank you.